So I'm an architect and I run a practice with my wife in Bangalore and for the past few months we've been working on a house in Bangalore and we thought maybe you know we've kind of reached a sweet spot it's a beautiful plan it looks out onto the lake uh, that's close by it's got beautiful places inside for intimate refuge and then our clients visited uh, Switzerland um, but contrary to what you may think what they came back with was uh, kind of a fundamental question for us so Manish asked me are we designing an Indian home so of course in in these jingoistic times that's quite a loaded question uh, <laughs> what is Indian and are we going to make an Indian home is there one way uh, but it is it, it led me to think about architecture and and what may be missing because whenever we get introduced to people as architects uh, normally what we get in response is oh what happened to architecture we had such amazing buildings all around us you know like this amazing building in Melkode and then of course we get buildings like that so that's uh, ITPL in Bangalore 2000 some of the buildings also try to kill us so that's a building in in London that reflected the light onto cars and burnt them uh, so <laughs> architecture can be quite powerful um, so what, what happened to architecture? This is a question. So in the next, whatever I have, 16 minutes, I'm going to solve that riddle for you, or at least try to. So a lot of my sort of brief talk is going to be based on Palazma's great book, Eyes of the Skin. And I think a lot of our problems stem from the fact that our culture sort of revolves around the eye, that everything that we've sort of started to do and appreciate and value comes from an appreciation of the eye sort of looking at things, just visually uh, sort of evaluating them and, and, and estimating them on that basis. So the dominance of the eye and the suppression of the other senses tends to put us into detachment, isolation and exteriority. Modernist design at large has housed the intellect and the eye but has left the body and the other senses as well as our memories, imagination and dreams homeless. So here's a kind of seminal image. This is René Magritte. This is 1929. So what do you believe? Do you believe the statement at the bottom which says, this is not a pipe? Or do you look at the image and say, hey, it's a pipe? But neither of those things are true because you can't take either the image or the word and put some tobacco in there and light it and puff away. You need the real engagement of all of those senses of touch, of inhaling, putting stuff in. So the eye deceives you, and that's why the, the, the painting is called The Treachery of Images, because we're constantly being fooled by what the eye sees and believes to be true, when every other sense may be needed to engage really with your environment. And in India, we have no shortage of that. I mean, we're surrounded with this kind of overstimuli. This is a, a great sort of example, you know, any street. I mean, you could shoot pictures in Trivandrum, anywhere. But we're surrounded with this and yet we continue to do buildings like what I showed you in, in Bangalore, these kind of glass and steel, isolated, enclosed, controlled environments, when we're surrounded with environments that are rich for the senses. Just looking at that photograph, you immediately know what it sounds like there, what it smells like, what it feels like to be on that street. And the eye sort of is giving you a license to imagine all of those things that you're so familiar with. Art has done that for years, ages. Art captures in that sort of flat environment all of the qualities of temperature, of, of comfort. Look at the painting of Matisse's painting. The image on the left, you see that threshold with the light on it and you know that that's the hot Mediterranean sun coming and just beyond the threshold is, is the beautiful shade and comfort. You're getting all the breeze from the sea. The painting is telling you about the environment. And that's true for Klimt as well. Look at that painting with, with the trees. You can almost hear your feet crunching the leaves as you walk towards the ocean. On the other side, you can feel the breeze. You can smell the sea. Great architecture does that too. It gives you an environment in which to appreciate all of those other things apart from the eyes, in addition to the eyes. The previous image was the I am Bangalore building by Doshi. That's Falling Water, one of the seminal works, one of the seminal houses where everything from, from that stone that is there, but this is the perfect spot from which to now hear that waterfall and, and embrace that environment. And a lot of the materials coming from that place to enrich your experience of where you are located in that particular environment. 
and Zumthor, the great Swiss architect, using special shuttering within the church that then evokes the sense of the forest and the light of being under that canopy. Great architecture sort of is bringing you that memory of a place that is, it's just not, you know, a sealed air-conditioned box. So that's the first aspect of it, this idea of a multi-sensory architecture where everything is sort of profoundly heightened. The second thing is a negation of this sort of supremacy of the eye and a celebration of the shadow. When we're in a sort of, in a state of deep meditation or we're enjoying some great music or we're in the embrace of our loved one, automatically our eyes are closed and we're sort of rejecting all of that distraction to really engage and absorb that experience. Great art does that. It tells you about those shadows, what's happening in the shadows. The first image, Caravaggio's painting of Jesus and doubting Thomas, who's coming to check. He's not trusting his eye, but he's touching Jesus to check. Is this really him? Is this really the wound? But look at the way it's painted. It's almost black at the back. The Romans are, are chasing these guys, right? It's, it's got this conspiratorial sort of sense about it, that all of these things happening in the shadows. And the other image, again, Jesus calling out to Matthew, who's a tax collector, come with me. But look how Caravaggio plays with the light. Jesus is standing in the shadow, pointing to Matthew, who's in the light, and telling him, come. That's not the way. Come here, you know. So this game of light and shadow creating an, a, a sort of really visceral sense of meaning. And great architecture, this is Alto in Finland, in this beautiful town hall where from, from the courtyard where you have a lot of light, you slowly progress to subsequently darker and darker places till you finally end up in a very dark chamber house where now it's no longer the performance, a chamber house where probably Trump won't do very well, but a chamber house where you re really need dialogue and conversation. Great Indian architecture, I mean, this is the Akbar's tomb in, in Sikandra. This was a profoundly moving experience for me. This is the gateway to Sikandra where Akbar is buried. It's just 30 minutes out of Agra. And it's a huge, humongous gateway, embellished with all of the riches. You walk in, this is the building where, you know, the Akbar is, is buried, the mausoleum. And you're entering through that gate with all of those, you know, fine jewels and, and emeralds and, you know, really the gateway of heaven. But the moment you pass through those doors, you're in a chamber almost devoid of any sensory stimuli. It's a blank white wall. There's no light. And at that point, as you cross that threshold, it's a profoundly moving experience, like as if you've crossed into a portal, into a place where it is a metaphysical condition, where you're in engagement with Akbar, in communion with him in that room. And it is really sort of moving. And, you know, we, we used to take students to Sikandra to see this. And you can sense that sort of profound moving experience. You, you guys have felt it when you go to great buildings, old buildings. Unfortunately, architecture does that, doesn't do that anymore. So that's about shadows. The next point is about the frame. And architecture has for long become the result of the great photograph. You know, all of us look at architecture and the great photograph and we think that that's the photograph. And of course, we have someone to blame. This is Alberti and Alberti's frame. And what he did was he, in the Renaissance, he sort of made the idea of the frame and to capture reality and perspective through that frame. We've all done this as students transferring the, cross, the, the grid onto, onto a sheet of paper and getting a sense of whatever is within that frame, flattening it out for whatever it is. But artists have riled against this for years. Turner's painting hardly being kept within that frame, sort of breaking out of the frame. Or Monet's great painting of the water lilies where the depth of that painting is uncertain, that you can see layer upon layer of stuff and it seems like that frame <laughs> cannot hold or, or is, again, a portal that takes you elsewhere. And sometimes art also subverts the notion of the viewer and the viewed. In Juan Munoz's great work where he fills the room with, with identical images of laughing people, when you enter that room, you feel like an interloper, as if you're under surveillance, as if you're being viewed, as if you're the piece of art and everybody is looking at you and, and sort of, you know, laughing at, at, at what... And, and even in the way that they've been placed there, they're sort of submerged as if you're on a pedestal being viewed as an object as you pass through this space. And Gormley in London, just outside the Hayworth Gallery, placing these figures on buildings everywhere as if notionally supervising or surveilling this environment, subverting the notion of the frame. 
This is a great artist from Mysore, Alvar Balasubramaniam, and he made this uh, thing out of Odonil. You know Odonil, right? The air freshener. And so that, that art slowly sort of disappears, it becomes a vapor. So what he says is that the art still exists in the room, except instead of the eyes, you're breathing it in, you know. So it's fantastic, right? It's, it's sort of disappearing, this notion of what is the engagement of the viewer and the, and the viewed. And great architecture, again, does that. It gives you a sense of something that... So what, what is it about the frame in architecture? I think the essential thing about architecture is the question of time. And this is the Ryonji Temple in Japan, where that wall at the back is 600 years old and is aging very, very slowly, whereas the gravel that is in front of it, around these rocks, is raked every day. And so as you're sitting there meditating on this gravel because you can't really focus on anything, you get a sense of that real perspective between what is really old and what is just done now. And this we see in India all over the place. In old temples you go, they do the rangoli every day in front of it. That's a notion of temporality, right? You understand the notion of something that's really old and something that's happening every day. And this, this idea of change is registered in the architecture. Kahn does it beautifully. This is Louis Kahn in, in California where he makes a concrete frame and infills it with a material which is disintegrating at a much faster rate than the concrete. And so you almost feel like the ruin, the, the, the frame of structure will stay there for a long time but the in, infill will change and, and sort of allow different things to come in as, as it grows and ages. This is I am again in Bangalore. And when, you, when it was first built, this is from the 70s, this photograph, and you see the, the sort of sensorial quality of that space, even without the landscape, the quality of texture of the stone, the quality of the light. But today when you go there, the buildings are almost completely obfuscated by this landscape, which is completely overgrown grown and thickly forested inside. So this idea of change being a part of the notion of architecture. And of course, there are subversions of that as well. This is uh, social housing in Chile. And what the architect very cleverly did is that they didn't have enough money and if they had to build houses, they had to push them out outside the city. And the idea was that you would build half a house and people, when they got money, would fill in the next half. And so this architecture becomes something that is completely DIY, do it yourself, but it allows for that sort of, you know, completely informal uh, kind of construction. There's also the idea of time in terms of the ruin and architects have been trying to recreate the conditions of ruin, ignoring the notions of window frames and sanitary fittings and lighting and, and air conditioning. So you start seeing only the structure and only the light that then is held within that structure. So look at that. By just suppressing the window frames that look out onto the Mediterranean, Utsun makes a building that is just about structure and light. And so it's pure in that, in that sense. And the last part of it is meaning. And in meaning, you have... Of course, in the Taj, the Garden of Eden, replicated in all of those floral motifs, but also very precious material. In, in Virgin Mary, the ultramarine, very expensive pigment in those days. The more ultramarine you saw in paintings, the more expensive the painting was. And so the association with cost, but also the Virgin is always in blue, if you notice. And then the last one was what Charles Correa spoke about, the deeper structure of things, where when we go to a stepped well or a tank, Immediately we're connecting to it on a primordial level, level as if we remember the history of man digging for water, that somehow the architecture is, is evoking those memories that have sort of come through all of our generations down to us. So memory is a very important part of meaning. This is Magritte again talking about the horse and the, and the clock, but labeling them as the door and the wind because he was arguing that when we view art, we are actually bringing to the art our own memories of those associations of the horse in that beautiful barn where the, the door was so lovely that I would open and go and visit the horse. So it, it, it's an associative memory of this icon to that uh, thing. And our art, uh, you know, in, in the old days used to be in a particular location, but now, of course, the art, the, the Stations of the Cross or religious art now finds its place in, in sort of more profane environments. But, of course, we've taken it to a whole other level where art can be on, on anything uh, you can imagine. And architecture, too, has got that kind of base, baseless. Uh, this is 1916 setback regulations making a building of a particular kind. And, of course, we do our own crap, not knowing anything about uh, what, what it means uh, in terms of the history of architecture. This is Alto in Finland. And uh, Alto, of course, Finland is very, very cold. So he's building this wall in Finland in his summer house, remembering his time in Italy on the beach. 
And so he brings in all of that Italian brick, he clads the building with that brick, and then he puts a little window, which is there, there with a lintel, and he puts in blue tile, and he says, that's the Mediterranean for me. And so this idea of memory and meaning interlinked, and all of us bringing to bear in our work this notion of memory. And of course, meaning is also geographical. This is that location where the two buildings are. It's at the end of the Euromere River and the Bay of Biscay, just, above, just near the Atlantic Ocean. But look at that. Isn't that. Doesn't that look like the river brought in all of that detritus right across Europe, came to this point, and as the waters receded, it emerged. And these jewels emerged, and this gold emerged, and those striations horizontally marking the flood levels as it fell down and this beautiful object that was then the result of the river flowing out into the ocean. And for the last project, this beautiful building that Monio did in, in uh, Spain, where up ahead it is the church, on the right is the palace, and what uh, Monio does. So just to talk about this facade, these are retables, and in the retables are all the angels and the, and the great patrons looking down onto the plaza. Monio does a building which has retables as well, except this is a public building, and there are people now accessing those balconies, and they become the deities looking out onto the plaza. So common people in a, in a public building occupying the place. So it's a subversion of the idea of power and, and, and hegemony over public environment. So it's sort of a political statement as a building. So just a quick recap, an architecture of the senses, in place of shadows, beyond the frame, and meaning. Instead of creating mere objects of visual seduction, architecture relates, mediates, and projects meanings. The ultimate meaning of any building is beyond architecture. It directs our consciousness back to the world and towards our own sense of self and being. Significant architecture makes us experience ourselves as complete, embodied, and spiritual beings. In fact, this is the great function of all meaningful art. So the question of Indianness, I think, we need to think a bit more fundamentally about being human first, about understanding the human condition and expressing that in our work. Thank you.